Let us pray. Prepare our hearts, O God, to accept your word. Silence in us any voice but your own. That hearing we may obey your will. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The scripture reading this morning is from the last half of the first chapter of Ephesians. Last week, the first half, an explosion of words and every grand theme of Christian thinking and living was packed it into one sentence that had no end. And now this is the first passage that follows, the implications and the further trajectories of the things that come from that first moment in Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 1, beginning with verse 15. For this reason, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all of God's people, I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the wisdom, the spirit of wisdom and revelation, so that you may know him better. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which you have been called, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is invoked not only in this present age, but also in the age to come. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be the head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. This is the word of the Lord. In Christ... This is the common core of what unites this series of sermons after Easter. This is the most frequent phrase and most central thought which fills the letter that Paul writes to the Christians in the church at Ephesus in Christ. This is what the Paul the Apostle considers the heart of the matters of the heart. We are in Christ. In the first half of this chapter, there was the Big Bang. Paul, in one sentence of over a hundred words, unleashed every important truth of our faith, exploding with an energy that will propel Christian thinking and living for ages. It's all there. Divine pleasure and will, human holiness and blamelessness, predestination and creation and adoption, redemption by blood and the forgiveness of sins, wisdom and understanding, mystery and knowledge, grace and peace, praise and glory, the fulfillment of all things in the unity between heaven and on earth. But surprisingly, and of first importance, I think we need to be told these things. I know I would not have guessed them. Something came before it all. God. God was in Christ. Christ was in God. This is at the heart of what we believe about the Trinity. The Father has always loved the Son. And the Son has always loved the Father. And the Spirit binds them together in that love. This love of God is eternal and exists before all other things. God loves. God is love. The love of God gives. It gives gifts. God, in loving Christ, gave gifts to Christ. This love of God for and within God, always perfect, always mutual, always, always, chose to love a humanity not yet created and chose to give gifts to that humanity. All of this was in Christ. God was in Christ. God loved Christ. God gave gifts to Christ. God gave every gift to Christ in the heavenly realms. 
Every blessing, therefore, now belongs to Christ. That's what Paul, the great teacher of the faith, wants us to know, and he wants us to know it first. God was in Christ. Know it first because it is first. God was in Christ first, before all other things, indeed, before all any other thing began. But that's not the end of the mystery in knowledge and the wisdom and understanding. It is its beginning. All doctrine is learning of God. First, who God is within God's self. If you want the big words, that's the doctrine of the imminent trinity, as God is to God. And then what God has done, the economic trinity, as God is toward us. Let me say it again, all this is in love. God's eternal perfect love for God, God's eternal perfect love for us. So again, the love of God for and within God, always perfect, always mutual, always, chose to love a humanity not yet created and chose to give gifts to that humanity. All of this God does I know you haven't forgotten, in Christ. God, Paul tells us, blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual gift in Christ. And now because Christ has come to us, all these gifts are being distributed to us. All these gifts, of course, are in Christ because we are in Christ. We are in Christ. Have you heard me say that before? Everything is coming our way. This is how it works in my family. I know I've told this story before, but to me it's the most perfect illustration of what it means to be in Christ, which I think is sometimes a mysterious and carefully nuanced idea, but here's the heart of it. When we would go on vacations, Lois and Jason would take one path and the two girls and I would take another. This was occasioned mostly because in his youth, my son was on crutches, and now that he's a man, it's about a wheelchair that helps him get around, all because of some things that presented themselves at his birth. Our pace of movement was different. A casual stroll on the boardwalk for Jason and his mother. A fast run on the beach for the girls, and at a certain point, me following behind breathlessly. Somewhere along the way, we'd take a break, and I would say to the girls, it's time to get back with Jason and mom, and they would say something like, Jason who? Because they were having a great time on their vacation day, going at their own pace and exhausting their dad. But all of that would change when we went to Great America, the Six Flags amusement park outside Chicago. Because, you see, if you're on crutches or in a wheelchair or otherwise handicapped, you do not stand in the two hour long lines to get on the roller coaster. You go right to the head of the line, really. And once you get into the roller coaster and have your ride, you do not need to get out after the first spin. You can stay for a second one. Now here's the point. You get this blessing and everyone who is with you on those days Rachel and Seda were all over Jason. You are my favorite person in the whole universe. I love you, brother. You love me more than my, my sister, don't you? I never want to be far from you. I always want to be next to you. Jason, I just can't get close enough to you. I just love you, big brother. He saw through it. But every blessing that belonged to him on those days belonged also to them. That's what it's like for us to be in Christ. God has given every spiritual blessing to Christ. And we, being in him, receive all these gifts ourselves. Unearned, undeserved, they were for Christ. And now they're being given to us. So what are these gifts that Paul wants so much for the Ephesians to know they have? These gifts are all connected to one another, I think. They flow from each other, they accompany each other. They too, in some ways, are in each other. Opening one gift reveals still another, which reveals yet another. They begin, Paul tells us, when we have the spirit of wisdom and understanding so that we know God better, that is, more fully, more intimately. That spirit with a capital S, the Holy Spirit, 
whom we are given in Christ and who leads us into all truth. We already know that this knowledge and wisdom, first and foremost, as always, is truth about God. The truth that God is love, loves, and loves humanity. And as that knowledge of God's love for us deepens within us, as we have a longer experience of it, as we begin to trust it more, as we begin to believe it more differently, as we begin to live it out more fully, as it deepens within us, the eyes of your heart will be enlightened, Paul says. I think that may be the most accurate and beautiful description of falling in love that I've ever read. The eyes of our hearts will be enlightened. Enlightened to the truth and beauty and goodness of the other. In this case, God, first, of course, toward him, who has loved us with such a perfect love, and then toward others whom God has loved with this same perfect love as he has loved us. Think of the two great commandments. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And as we come to know the height and depth of God's love for us, our love begins and grows. What comes from this gift of knowing God's love? Hope. Great hope. We begin to reimagine everything. Better still, we begin to hear with expectant ears all of what God from the beginning has promised us in Christ. We are open to it now. Think it actually possible. Ready to believe, ready to trust, ready to hope for what we do not yet see, but what we fully expect now someday will be. When we begin to understand how great is God's love for us, we begin to comprehend what great gifts God has given to us. When I begin to truly believe, believe every promise God has made, and believe God is for us, I begin to believe the gifts he has given. It has never been that God's giving needed to grow, but it has always been true that my readiness to receive has needed to grow. Hope enlarges my expectation. Faith enlarges my capacity to receive every other good gift of God. Paul calls these gifts that God is giving the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people. When I stop thinking of God as apathetic toward me, I will stop thinking of God as stingy. And when I start thinking of God's generosity toward me, I begin to hope. And that's our calling. In a hopeless world, we are the people that hope. That's our calling as a holy people, Paul argues. Holiness hopes. Sometimes I think, we think, that holiness does only the opposite. We think holiness, true holiness, the holiness that knows right from wrong, and holiness knows right from wrong, judges, perhaps even severely, and then announces that judgment. And it abstains. True religion oneself, we know, is to keep oneself unstained by the world. And this is true, fully true, as far as it goes. But Paul teaches us here steps further. Holiness hopes. It does not merely lament that the world is dying without a savior. It rejoices because this world has a savior, a pretty good one as it turns out, the savior of the world, God's appointed salvation for his whole creation. Holiness does not stop at saying, if you follow that path, brother, you will be lost. It doesn't say less than that, but it says more than that. Holiness gladly announces, brother, you have been found. And hope genuinely expects that brother will be saved. The holiness that hopes, that is built on our growing, deepening knowledge of God's great love for humanity in Christ, is a holiness that invites holiness, not merely judges unholiness. 
Well, maybe I've already crossed the line from preaching into meddling, but what I say next, I, I know it's meddling. Here's a statement that will not do for God's holy people of hope. The world is unholy, we correctly observe. It's largely unrepentant in its idolatry and in its tyranny, we see that. God will do something mighty and they will be mighty sorry. And the sooner the better. We sometimes have murmured. This will not do. This will not do for the holy people of God who hope because we have, we have experienced his love. Sin, sorrow, sickness, sustained trespassing against the commands of God, yes, we know these things because we did these things. We have experienced and have come to understand by the Spirit of God, all these things will be met by the love of God, a love that is overflowing from God to humanity in Christ, a love that saves. Our calling is not so much to see and to comment on the world's wickedness. Frankly, it's too easy to print that newspaper. It is to know and to witness to God's grace in the midst of the world's wickedness. When the world errs, and it almost always does, our calling is not to mutter, tisk, tisk but to proclaim with hope the love of God in Christ. Friends, stop being surprised when the pagans act like pagans. Start expecting the saints to proclaim with hope the good news of the love of God in Jesus Christ. From this hope comes the next gift, the gift Paul most wants to celebrate and most wants us to receive in this passage, knowledge, experience of the power of God, a power we now have. God has all power, God was in Christ, Christ has all power then, we are in Christ, we have this power. That's the logic, here's the possibility. The same power that raised Christ from the dead, Paul says, the same power that raised Christ to the heavens, the same power that placed all things, all things, in this world and in the world to come under Christ's feet, the same power that appointed Christ to be head for the sake of the church, which is his body, a head and body which now fills everything in every way, this same power is in us because we are in Christ. Did you see that one coming? Would you have expected that? Hope leads to power. This is more than the, if I think I can, I'm more likely to accomplish whatever. It's more than that, it's not less than that, but it's more than that. It is that I now know that because of God's great love for me, I can hope, indeed expect, God will accomplish all things. And through me, through us, God in me, me in Christ. Well, I'm sorry to report, I'm not done meddling yet. Here it goes, second round and last round. A holy people who knows this power of God, which is filling the world, never quits on the erring world. God is not tired of his creation, and he has not quit on his purposes of redeeming all that he has made. And if it's cool for God, who alone is perfectly holy, to still love this unholy place peopled by, well, peopled by people. Who are we to quit earlier? 
God never quits on an erring world. Neither are we to do this. Or on an erring nation. Or on an erring people. Or on an erring denomination. Or on an erring congregation. Or an erring friend or foe. Or an erring spouse or child. You wouldn't do it. Don't do it. God didn't. God doesn't. God won't. His love of the perfect one, Christ, has overflowed into a love of the imperfect ones, you and me. I can think a few other sure ways for us to deny the power of the gospel than to quit on loving because we decided it does no good or to quit on proclaiming because they haven't converted yet or to quit praying because God hasn't answered yet. Frankly, I suspect these things in me and if so, they are based on unbelief, a failure to trust that God will win over the world, not just win over it, a failure to believe in the power of God to save, or worse yet, a failure to believe God wants to save. A failure to remember that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And we do not hope or act with power because we do not trust God to love. We consider our efforts to be worthless and so quit. All quitting is quitting too soon. This is not the spirit of wisdom and understanding. This is not the love of God poured out in our hearts. This is not hope. This is not the power that raised Christ from the dead. It's just not. There. I think I'm done meddling for the morning. That first passage in chapter one from last week, which teaches us all the blessings, has the form of a blessing like my worship ending blessing for you. It both announces and it offers the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. The long, too long to say it in one breath, sentence that be begins Ephesians, announces and offers our blessings. Election by God, holiness and blamelessness, predestination and adoption as the children of God, redemption through Christ's blood, the forgiveness of sins, wisdom and understanding, mystery and knowledge. Now the Big Bang has exploded. All comes from it, all comes after it. Until the fulfillment of all things in a unity again, in heaven and on earth. On earth be the surprising term there. Christ who has given all the gifts given him in the heavenly realms has now come to earth to us. And these gifts are ours. This passage is not in the form of a blessing. This passage is in the form of a prayer. More accurately, the report of a prayer. The many prayers. The prayers of the Apostle Paul. It's a very personal message. We have gone from the cosmic, as God is with God, to the intimate, Christ in us. All of this in a movement between a blessing and the prayers of the preacher. Let me say it again one more time, but differently this time. What is intimate to God, God loving God, has gone wide to his creation and now down to earth and now inhabits the prayers of the first pastor of the people of God in Ephesus. I want you to know that it fills the prayers of your current pastor in San Diego, a congregation of the holy people of hope. That you may know the hope to which you were called, the riches of his glorious inheritance in you, his holy people, and the incomparable great power in you who believe. 
This is my prayer for you. I thought you might want to hear a report of it. Let us pray. By your spirit, help us who have begun to believe, to believe more fully. Help us who have experienced your love to trust it more deeply. Help us who have imagined hoping for hope to hope and who have heard about your power to experience it and for the sake of the world. Hear our prayers. Amen.